From the get-go, I want to stress, we're not talking about a typical steam locomotive. It doesn't run on rails, because you were probably wondering then, how did a steam explosion happen at a fairgrounds? Were there railroad tracks nearby? Nope. Nope. This explosion happened as a result of a failure of a steam traction engine. Those who grew up with Thomas the Tank Engine might be familiar with the concept of a traction engine because one of the characters, Trevor, was in fact one of these little creations. The first traction engine was invented in 1859 by Thomas Avely. When he was doing an experiment to try to see if he could create a steam engine that could run not on rails, basically. The initial creation used a driving chain between the crankshaft and the rear axle. However, the vast majority of traction engines, which would be evolved and pretty much stay the same by the late 1860s, wound up using a gear system to propel themselves forward. While the main concept of traction engines remained pretty much the same, there were a ton of variations in terms of layouts, wheel types, wheel arrangements, even some that used early caterpillar track like a tank. Traction engines were developed for farm usage. They were pretty much tractors, farm tractors, before farm tractors were a thing. And to be honest, the modern farm tractor are the reasons why traction engines became not really much of a thing by the early 1900s. Once gasoline and diesel-powered tractors became much more affordable, traction engines fell out of favor. There were also a lot of restrictions regarding inspections and safety protocols that had to do with the operation of a traction engine that just didn't apply to a combustion-style tractor. Whether it's diesel or gasoline, it didn't really matter. It was considered a lot safer. And safety is definitely a relevant topic when we're talking about any kind of steam explosion, and like I said, this happened in 2001, just over two decades ago. You'd think we would have learned, but apparently people still consistently underestimate the power of steam pressure and what you have to do in order to safely operate a steam engine of any kind. And a lot of people pointed out that steam is relatively safe as long as you know what you're doing, and you're right. Steam isn't inherently dangerous, it's just a lot more volatile if something goes wrong and if procedures aren't followed. And given how many people just don't maintain their regular road vehicles, I can kinda see why steam on regular roads isn't exactly a common thing. But I digress. The traction engine in question was a Case 110 HP. And by traction engine standards, these were pretty big. There were quite a few in preservation, and in fact, there are a lot of traction engines in the general in preservation. The owner of this 110, Cliff Kaposik, was taking the traction engine to the Medina County Fairgrounds on July 29, 2001, because the Medina County Fair was scheduled to begin the following day. Many localities have local fairs, and in fact, I'm sure most of you have either seen or been to one at some point. It's a time of socialization, entertainment, weird food, and just getting together with friends. Fun for the community. And taking a traction engine to such an event would be a novel curiosity. People would want to see that. I mean, I'm totally on board for such a thing. Except for the little itsy bitsy problem that as Cliff was taking the traction engine onto the fairgrounds, something went wrong. The 110 exploded. Over 50 people were injured and five were killed. Cliff Kofasik, the owner, was among the dead, as well as his son, William, who was only 27. Additional victims included Alan Kimball, who was 46, Dennis Youngbluff, who was 58, and Brian Hammond, who was only 18. The injuries included what you might expect in a steam explosion, severe burns from the blast wave, as well as broken bones from the destroyed traction engine. But the real questions came afterwards. What the heck caused this thing to blow up? Traction engines are designed to be easy to operate because they were meant to be used by farmers. It's not like this was a full-size steam locomotive that was running on rails. It shouldn't have been much of a problem, except for a handful of things. And in this case, there were two probable causes given for why the 110 exploded that day. The first report was conducted by Dean Jagger, who was the chief boiler inspector of the state of Ohio, and it was released two weeks after the accident. According to Dean and his team of inspectors, they felt the explosion happened due to, as many of you have already kind of guessed, a crown sheet failure. As we've been over this, if you let the water get too low in your steam locomotive, it allows the crown sheet to become exposed to the air, 
and overheat. When the water reaches it again, it causes a reaction that makes the water flash into steam immediately, raising the pressure at a rate that the engine's infrastructure cannot compensate for, and it explodes. This particular boiler was hand-fired, and the feed water was required to be introduced manually. It didn't have any automatic systems, so it was completely on the operator to make sure that water was getting into that boiler. Therefore, it seems likely that Cliff simply allowed the water to drop too low, and it wouldn't be the first time in history that's happened, and most steam explosions after 1900 do seem to happen because of this issue. But there was a lot more going on here, and even Dean Jagger's team pointed this out, that the engine itself was in horrible condition. And he noticed the fusible plugs, which this engine was equipped with and would have warned of an impending explosion had they melted, were actually welded shut. Therefore weren't able to melt, blow out, and release the pressure. A second report was conducted on the incident, and this one was conducted by John D. Payton, who was the director of the Certified Boiler Engineers for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Which, for those of you that don't live in America, is the neighboring state. Well, technically Commonwealth, as I said, but we don't really get technical about it. It's whatever. John felt that it may not have been the driver's fault necessarily in terms of operation. He believed that the state of the traction engine in general was more the problem, because as he looked over the remains of the boiler, specifically the crown sheet, he found that in certain places, the sheet had thinned by as much as 77%. The original thickness of this should have been around 0.375 thousandths of a foot, which is a really weird way of measuring that, but that's how they do it apparently, so okay. But the actual thickness of this particular crown sheet after the degradation that it had seen over the years was only 0.087 thousandths, which leaves just 23% of the original thickness of that crown sheet. And it was not the only component that had degraded that much. According to John, had this traction engine been presented for its required inspection in Pennsylvania, the boiler would have been placed out of service and not been allowed to operate at all, at all. And that brings up the question, well, why didn't Ohio put it out of service? Well, that's because at the time of the accident, Ohio didn't have any procedures in place for the inspection of this type of engine. Traction engines were seen as kind of a no man's land, and in fact the debate is still kind of raging regarding how much oversight Ohio is going to put into place regarding this type of locomotive. The people that want it basically say that they don't really care if someone wants to mess around with one of these things in their backyard. That's not their problem. The fact is, the owner, Cliff, took it to a fair where a bunch of other people were around and it exploded because of his inability to maintain the engine. Had there been a test regarding its operation, had there been some kind of inspection procedures or a licensing provision? I mean, heck, I found footage of this thing driving on the open road. And you mean to tell me that we all have to go through a regular driving test to drive a regular automobile, which, generally speaking, aren't going to randomly explode because we didn't put the gas in right or something. But this dude can drive a traction engine down a city street with no oversight in place, no license, no nothing like that, like, it sounds a little unreasonable to me. And I'm usually the type who doesn't really want the government in my business, but when someone's ineptitude is endangering other people's lives, like fairgoers who just want to have a nice family fun day and would rather not be exploded, I don't think it's unreasonable to suggest that perhaps some kind of inspection procedure should be put into place for this type of thing to make sure that whatever it is, is safe. To this day, many states in the U.S. still don't actually have a certification process for steam engines, or even any kind of licensing procedure for steam engineers, let alone inspections. Some do, and I will say the vast majority of heritage railways in our country do take steps to ensure that their steam locomotives are well maintained and taken care of. And there are some procedures in place regarding running such an engine on open main lines. So I wouldn't necessarily worry too much about the engines that run on rails. But when it comes to traction engines, a lot of places just kind of let them be. And as we just went over, uh, five people were killed because they just let it be. And I'm just saying, maintain your equipment, guys. I don't think that's unreasonable. Till next time, this is Darkness, and I bid you all a fond farewell.